Why is it that we have spelling bees in English? They do not have spelling bees in Germany. They do not have spelling bees in France and Spain. Well, maybe they do if, it's, if you're at like an English language school, but they don't have it for those national languages. And the reason is that in French, in Spanish, in German, there is a relatively stable and reliable, consistent correspondence between combinations of letters and the sounds that people make with their mouths. This is not the case in English. English is a handful when it comes to spelling. It is difficult for native speakers, for first language English speakers, to acquire uh, a, a command of English spelling, much less second language learners. This is History of the English Language. I'm Dr. Newman, Missouri State University, and we're gonna talk about what is wrong with English spelling. So what is wrong with English spelling? Well, these examples are drawn from Van Gelderen's History of the English Language. Um, think of the sound E. In Spanish, that sound is made either with the letter I or very occasionally with the letter Y. In English, we can, we can make that, let's look at these words here. She, Harry, believe, Caesar, see, people, sees, sees, amoeba, key, machine, sweet, and key. We have the same sound being made with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 different combinations of letters. What is up with that? What about the sound ooh? Another one of the basic vowels in the five vowel system, which we'll talk about in the next video. Two, 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 through, through, clue, su, suit, flu, flu, poo, flu, shoe. Wow. Just wow. Tough. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Now we've got a different problem in that the same combination of letters, O-U, can make a whole bunch of different sounds. Tough, previous, ought, through, do, and out. All of these are drawn from page 16 of History of the English Language by Van Gelderen. So why is English spelling so inconsistent? First of all, there's no national language authority either in the UK or the United States to um, impose or regulate spelling. The regulation of spelling has mostly happened through a combination of agreements by editors, publishers, uh, universities, but basically it's kind of like a cons an, in an informal consensus. You don't, in France, you have in Paris the Académie Française, which um, basically says, these are the rules of the language, you have to follow them. Um, there, has, there have been efforts since the 1500s to reform English spelling and impose some kind of consistency or uniformity. Since the 1500s all the way through the 1900s, I'm sure some people are still at it, but you know, I mean, we can't get Americans to adopt the metric system. You think we're going to uh, change our spelling? No. Um, so there's been no successful spelling reform movement ever. Um, and here's another thing. When pronunciations changed in English, for, for who knows why, older spellings were, were kept. So you know like a knight, like the knight's tail, like gallops around on a horse, he's got a lance, wears armor. What's the K doing there? What is the GH doing there? Well, here's the thing. Back in 1350, when there were knights running around, it was pronounced, as we'll learn in a few weeks, Knicht, Knicht, with the K being pronounced before the end, and that GH being like a what's called a velar fricative, a <laughs> like a cat hissing, <laughs> or or the vampires and what we do in the shadows. <laughs> um, yeah, Knicht. Uh, all the letters were pronounced through the word through, like I'm going through the tunnel, used to be pronounced like fruch, like fruch, like you get a little phlegm at the end there. But we don't do that anymore. But we're still spelling it that way. It's crazy. Um, also, the, our vowels all got kind of switched around. Uh, somewhere between 1450 and 1550, an event happened, which we're going to talk about at great length later in the semester, called the Great Vowel Shift. Um, and that caused a mismatch between vowel qualities. This is why the letter I, as in Iceland or Ireland, or I am Professor Newman, um, has that quality I and not the sound E that it has in 
every other language in Europe, pretty much, except except oh, in a few cases in in English. We like machine um, and uh, chlorine and a few others where the I makes that sound, but rarely. And there's other cases like this. All, all our vowel sounds got changed around, um, and but the spelling stayed the same. It didn't. We didn't update the vowel, the letters to match the sound. Also, and here's another thing, and this is this has been more of an issue in, in the last couple hundred years or so. Loan words, that is a word that we borrow from other language or steal, depending on who you ask. Loan words are incorporated without spelling changes. So, for example, phoenix from Greek, um, that O-E um, represents a, a Greek sound. Sweet in French, xylophone, quota, chagrin, gnomic euphemism, debris, glacier, all these have been borrowed from their source languages with very, very little alteration. Um, and so uh, if, we're, if you're borrowing from a whole bunch of different languages, uh, Greek, French, German, Spanish, Hindi, um, then, and you're not really updating or changing the spelling, then what happens is that you're going to have the spelling conventions of a whole bunch of different languages mixed together in one. Um, one final uh, interesting uh, feature of um, the uh, English spelling and the English writing system, haha, is that uh, what happens is that people try to reconstruct the pronunciation of a word based on how it's spelled, um, especially if they haven't heard the word spoken. This is something, I bet, you're, I bet you were one of those smart kids that would mispronounce words that you read and somebody would correct you and say, that's not how it's said, it's said like this. And, and that's, why, that's why you're taking this English class now. Um, this is something that a lot of people have done over time. And sometimes those spellings have stuck. So for example, let's look at um, often. Now, the often is spelled with a T, but it was not, the T was not pronounced for centuries. Often is was how it's spelled. And in Britain and in a lot, many parts of the United States, they still say often. Um, although nowadays I hear more and more people say oftentimes, oftentimes. Uh, oftentimes seems to be replacing often. But anyway, the L in salmon as well, salmon, when people say that, that's, that's another example of... Uh, Sorry, I really need my coffee. That's another example of a spelling pronunciation. Um, uh, the way my sister-in-law says jalapenos. Now, she is Canadian, and there's a whole country between her and Mexico, so let's give her that. Um, here's, here's an example of spelling pronunciations, one that um, stuck and one that never did. Um, the word waistcoat, like a vest, like in, back in the early 90s, it was very popular to have like your paisley waistcoat with your with your mullet and your you know um anyway the, this is the really early 90s before grunge hit um anyway the waist it was actually pronounced for a while waistcoat like waistcoat like where's my waistcoat jeeves have you seen my waistcoat but but it's spelled waistcoat and it always was and so at some point people started saying it like it was spelled again especially in the united states i think i'm not sure but one has been stru stuck around because people love these nautical things like the the foxhole is the forecastle, and it's sp still spelled forecastle, but if you say forecastle, someone will say, oh, oh, oh foxhole. Um, same with a bosun, is a, is a boat swain, which is a, some kind of officer on a boat. I uh, know, I'm not a boat person. Um, one final um, key uh, thing to say about spelling pronunciations is that they can work as, and here's a fun linguistics term for you, shibboleths. Um, so for example, example, um, if you if you say um, if if I come here and and to to Springfield, Missouri, and I'm like, oh, I'm just I'm just going to be driving over to the next town over, which is Bois d'Arc, which is how it's written in French, Bois d'Arc. But people locals will say, you mean Bodark, and I'll go, ah, so they'll know I'm not from around here. Um, same thing if you're in Massachusetts and you say Worcester rather than Worcester people will know you're not from around there. Or, or a famous one in the United States, of course, is um, people who say Oregon rather than Oregon. Um, place names in this way can often act as shibboleths. <clears throat> and a shibboleth is a linguistic feature um, that can give you away as either belonging or not belonging to a specific <clears throat> group of people. Um, 
And I just added on this video here, Gloucestershire as an example. So if you say Gloucestershire, people will, people will know you're not from the, the, the Cotswolds in England, I think. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, anyway, that's the gist. I think I went on talking about spelling pronunciation too long. The important point here is that linguistics, um, and this is what leads us into our next video we were, where we will talk about phonology and the international phonetic alphabet. The important here is that linguistics is not based on writing. Linguistics is, uh, is the study of language, but not necessarily the written language, because with all respect to Derrida, um, writing is an imperfect reprodu reproduction of spoken language. And we are interested in, in speech line, in the spoken language, which is the natural instinct that almost all human beings have. We um, will automatically, as a child, acquire the language that we are exposed to or languages that we are exposed to readily by the time we're about five years old. Our little brains will just suck up and we'll learn the grammar and, we won't, and we'll, we'll have the basic system down by the time we are five. Writing, not so much because writing is a technology. It's an acquired skill. It's not an inherent part of what makes us human. And it's something that has to be learned with, great diff with greater or lesser difficulty, but not without effort. You don't just absorb writing just from watching other people do it the way a child absorbs speaking and, and understanding just from being around people who are speaking and understanding. It's pretty amazing. Even in languages with more system, systematic and consistent writing systems, no writing system accurately represents the sound of a language perfectly. The scientific study of language and the sound of language requires, therefore, a uniform and universal system of transcription, the international phonetic alphabet, and the, the linguistic uh, focus of phonology, the study of the sounds that are the building blocks of meaning in language, um, and, and IPA, which is used to represent it, is going to be the topic of our next video. That about wraps us things up for right now, so I'll see you there. Thanks. Bye.